It's been 15 years since Aberdeen defied all the odds and qualified for the UEFA Cup group stage after holding the much-fancied Dnipro in their own backyard. The game ended 1-1, which meant Jimmy Calderwood's side went through on the away goal roll. Hi everybody, a very warm welcome to Ali Beg ABTV. Can you believe it's been 15 years since the game in the Ukraine? Coming up a little bit later, I'm going to be speaking to former captain Derek Young, who's got some hilarious stories to share for you. And shortly, I'll be speaking to Xander Diamond, who took his place in the centre of defence that night alongside Andrew Considine. But I thought we would start the show by reminding ourselves of the team that Jimmy Calderwood picked to play against Dnipro. And he went with a 4-1, 4-1 formation. Jamie Langfield, who had the most unbelievable night in Dnipro. In front of him, Richard Foster, Andrew Considine, Xander Diamond and Michael Hart. And then Scott Severin acting as a protector of the back four. In front of Scott, Jamie Smith, Chris Clark, Barry Nicholson and Derek Young. And then Darren Mackey, who came in for the injured Lee Miller, took his place up front. So let's introduce our first guest. Thanks again to Derek Ironside for presenting me with these photographs. Here is Xander Diamond. Hi Xander, great to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me tonight. I would like to jump straight in. Let's talk about when you arrived at Dnipro and you got to get a feel for the pitch and your surroundings the night before the game and you trained. What are your recollections of that evening? First recollection was it was a, a, an old fashioned stadium, um, a big long tunnel. Uh, the changing rooms were like a big, big chair for each player. It wasn't like normal changing rooms. Um, the walk onto the pitch felt as if it was like half an hour walk. It was a big walk. I think there was a track around it. But um, the striking thing for me was the scoreboard. You know, it was like a sort of bulbs. And that then a factor that will that'll come into the story as we, we, as we go on. There's bulbs that go around the stadium and it was just so old clock. Um, so you could tell it was a very, very old stadium. Um the grass, I think, I think they left it, I left the grass fairly long. I think recollection was that to kind of obviously disrupt. But um, there was a lot of people in the stadium that shouldn't have been in the stadium. And I think, well, we know they were there to distract us. We we'll always remember doing a, I think it was a, a ways of attack, or a crossing finishing drill towards one of the goals, and there was like a, like a dance group or cheerleaders like set up behind the goals. You know, so there must have been 30, 40, like, girls just, like, dancing away and stuff like that. And I don't think Jimmy was too pleased um, about that. So suddenly we changed and started shooting to the opposite side with nobody behind the goal. Five minutes later, ten minutes later, the same group are behind that goal. Um, so that was sort of, you know, you didn't want to kind of laugh. It was a serious fixture that was coming up for us. I think smoke bombs, or there was a lot of tyre factory, I believe, was behind the stadium. That went up in smoke, so there's the smoke billowing into the stadium. And then there was journalists. I think, well, there must have been about 10, 12, 15 journalists. Journalists, just talk to any player in the tunnel. It's almost like a free access. We were, like, bemused, because as the format went on into the tournament, it was all kind of closed doors and everything mm -hmm. like that. So... I wouldn't. I think there was a lot of dirty tactics going on the night before, um, and then go, even going to the bus. There was you no. Know, I'm sure we had players talking to these journalists, and they weren't journalists, you know, asking questions. But it was all new for us, so we didn't really know um, what it, what it was about. So that was a sort of the theme, the way it went. But for myself personally, I, I was taking injections at the time, so I was just happy to, to get through training and to make the game. Um, so yeah, so it was a bit, a bit kind of. Uneasy, but the boys remain focused and professional as ever, as, as we always were under, under Jimmy Stewart's ship. Let's talk about Jimmy, the night of the game. What was he like in the build-up to kick-off? Um, the build-up to kick-off? I, see, I, I don't really know. I, I, can't, I can't remember. I'm not really... He always had his team meetings. You know, his team meetings would have been right rigorous we knew our roles that was one thing with jimmy even if it was a, a league cup game a pre-season friendly a, a massive european night for the for the club 
he would always be prepared. And that was one thing that struck me very much. We, we didn't know an awful lot about them, but for the first leg, we knew the danger men. We knew the danger men. And we knew going over into their backyard, it would be very, very difficult. But yet they drilled into us. Very, very set up, rigid, um, you know, a defensive performance in a way, but it got the job done. But my recollection, Jimmy would have just been his normal self. Probably deep down, he'd have felt it with, with the nerves and things like that because of the magnitude um, of the fixture and um, the history of getting into the UEFA Cup. But he was usual self, going about pre-match, going about the pitch, getting the players up, words of wisdom to one or two. And um, and yeah, it was just probably more relaxed. I never felt any time like if I was anything different. That, that was the problem and kept everything the same. So it took 27 minutes for us to score the goal, which we will come to. But how do you think we started the game? How did you get a feel for it as those sort of minutes were ticking down to when we scored? I think we were, as I said, the setup, we were, we were always quite good um, in a way that we knew our shape, we knew our roles. We knew we just couldn't go out all guns blazing going away from Europe. Again, we were a lot of, it was a, a lot of a new experiences for probably most of the boys and after the first leg it was it was very cagey very cagey the first leg but George always remember that you know I mean finishing nil nil do not concede the away goal and and that was probably maybe the, the setup it was if we sit in here and we can hit an account and which obviously the goal the goal comes from then the away goal obviously counts as two so I think it was more a case of do not give them any chances be really tight um, and win, win your battles and, and see what it and see what it takes us but you know, is it a game we're going to come to? You know, it's still a massive, a massive moment in the, in the club's history when we, when when Dazza scores that scores that memorable goal. Well, let's talk about that goal because I'm actually fascinated to know, 15 years later, if you can still see the goal in your own memory. Can you? Yep, because again, the <clears throat> the Dons fans were behind the goal. You've got the big clock. Yeah. You've got, and it was all that up at that stage. You've got the, the bulbs going round and everything like that. And the red the red army in, in the corner. And you're down the left hand side, you know, Fozzie goes down down um to the byline. Use his left foot, which at, at that time I never knew he had a left foot, but managed to dig the cross out. And um and again, the photograph you see with Azza with the hair and everything like that, um, he'd just been recalled to the team because yeah. uh I think he hadn't started a lot um, at the beginning of the season, whether that's through form or through injury, I'm not too sure. I think the, the manager went with Lee Muller at the time. So it proved a, a, a master sort we're getting him on. I think, again, they've set up for his, he used his pace. But for Daza, you know, that, that incredible photo, and uh, I can still, you know, you can vision because I'm obviously right behind it and it hits the back of net, bang. You want to celebrate. You, by all means, you see the supporters, you, you see, you know, the and everything like that, and, but you're looking, it's only 27 minutes. No, I mean, the, the bulbs are still illuminated round the 45, and that's only the first half. So, um, so yeah, it was almost, almost like, right, they've got to score two to go through. They've got to score two. So, what do you do now? The head's gone. It's almost like you're, you're playing it against Celtic or Rangers. Can we get to half-time now? Can we get to half-time? Can we not concede now and then regroup? and see what the manager's got to say at half-time. So what did the manager say at half-time? I knew you were going to ask that, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I think it would have just been along the lines of keep it keep it tight. I, I, no, I tell you what, I wasn't in. I wasn't in. I was getting a, another injection, sorry. I tell oh, a lie. Really? I wasn't in. I didn't, I didn't know what the manager said. But again, mm. presuming the way it works, in the way sort of the, the boys would have, have worked it would have been keep it tight, you know, we've enjoyed it. We've got 45 minutes of hard work and we're on the brink of getting into the group stages. You know, we've travelled a long way. It's what we've wanted from the previous season to get into Europe proper and go out and probably just do yourself justice. Do not give anything away and try and push up the park, which we didn't really do because <laughs> it was just almost camped in. <laughs> Actually, I remember speaking to Barry Nicholson about it and he made me laugh during a chat when he said we literally played a formation of 10-0. <laughs> yeah, I think it was the first time. It was unbelievable. I always remember, I think, Scott Severin, I think we were on the plane back 
and um, as I said, and throughout all the celebrations and all that, and I think I only touched the ball three times in the second half or something. I think the ball was just going whoa like that yeah. all the time, and yeah. um, not incredible. I, I've always been intrigued to know because it was like the Alamo. Let's be honest here, and it was relentless. How do you keep switched on? How do you keep that focus? And I know you were quite a vocal player, Xander. So are you always talking? To, to Michael and to, to Richard and to Andrew and Jamie. Did, did that sort of communication never stop? Yeah, I think I think that's important. I think you've hit the nail on the head there with the communication, you know, just organization, having mm. your two banks of four and, and 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 playing tight and getting your full backs in. And, and bear in mind Andrew was still young at the time. Yeah. It was a, I, I was still young, you know, Michael looking for help at Fozzie was still young, you know what I mean? So it was sort of an experience in a way going to Europe, you know, but what a credible performance like and the goal that they'd got, it, it wasn't if they cut us open. It was a, a clearance from, from Andrew and the guys just, I think it was Warren Bate that scored it and he's ricocheted it and it's went in. Mm. And, you know, it's not as if they've cut us open. So that was, again, they've cut us open. They've hidden shots for distance and things like that, which, again, you would say we're organised, we're set up well. And Big Langer's produced a couple of good yeah. things I've got. We actually have scored, and that's actually have scored a header. I think it was about... 25 minutes to go, 20 minutes to go, I should have scored. And that was always, always rankled with me because it, it, it would have made our night a wee bit, a wee bit easier. Um, so that chance always always plays in my mind even to this day. But um, but like you say, we, we, we camped on, camped to two banks of four, 10, zero, whatever you want to call it. And we, we stood up to the challenge that night. Yeah. The hostile crowd, you know, they, their fans were still singing until the final whistle because... Obviously, the, the backing they've got, I think all oh, our fans were, they went quiet because they're like, and they said, no, we need to enjoy it. And they went quiet again because the nerves, it all kicks in, you know what I mean? But I think incredible performance. And again, it was 11 Scotsmen that started that night. Mm. 11 Scotsmen started that night. So a really, really dogged performance. Um, I think Stevie Lovell came on, so we can say he was adopted in that. But um, <laughs> to, to, go, to go over there and say, you know, 11 Scotsmen there was there in Ukraine. And a, and a very, very fiery fixture because they, their, their fans made it difficult for us as well. And we could have crumbled over there, but we, we held our own. And, you know, and as you say, the, the celebrations at the end were, were absolutely fantastic. Well, let me ask you about that because, again, I'm fascinated to know was the emotion one of relief or was it one of joy? Personally, I think it was a mixture for myself. Um, I think with you, you put so much energy mentally and physically into a game like that, to, the concentration levels, as we've, as we've spoken about, you, I think you just fall to knees, but then emotion takes over that. I think I ran over to, to the Dons fans and I've got big Derek, Derek Ironside, the photographer, he's got a good yeah. photo yeah. again, yeah. and sure. Marcel on the, on the board, and again, what's behind us is the big clock, you know, um, all the bulbs illuminated at that time which was great or they were out whatever whatever way it was so that was the end of the game um but i think more relief but i think you see celebrations at the end and because they were stunned they were absolutely stunned they didn't think that um that we were anything anything um special and we heard quotes and all that we were written off even by our own press going over there and um, but we we were assured in a way that if we got the goal we could defend well and we were fit and that was some again Fitness in you physically, but, fi but fitness in the mind also played a big part. So, again, wild celebrations, back to the changing room, and um, again, I think it was just emotion, your hugging, your the realization of what you've done. And um, yeah, going to the airport, I think you started to have the down when you were on the bus going to the airport, the tiredness started to yeah. kick over. My injections were wearing yeah. off, I think I took yeah. three, three in that, that evening. You know, and um, just to get through it. And I remember John Sharp saying to me, you need to calm down because you're going to be double sore because it'll wear off. Aye, all right, Sharp, you may bother, may bother. But at that time, we were at the airport and all the Dons fans, I think we were the last flight out, they were on the bar. And we were all sitting out as players, I think, exhausted for what we've done. But then we went on the plane, we enjoyed it. You know, the sing song, we're sitting with different players and talking and Sharpie still sit down, sit down, and I always remember touching down Scotland, I just couldn't move, couldn't move. <laughs> I actually froze, uh, my, my groin said froze with the, with the, the, the soreness of my, so, so yeah, but all worth it in the end, wouldn't change a minute of it. 
Brilliant. Xander, mate, thank you so much for coming on tonight. It's uh, been fantastic hearing your story and thank you for your time. And hopefully we shall catch up again very soon. Pleasure, Ali. Thank you. Bye, mate. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. There we are. Xander Diamond. Doesn't he look well? Just before I introduce to you Derek Young, I thought I would throw in some of the match stats from the game against Dnipro. So if you didn't know, Aberdeen had actually never progressed through a European tie, having not won the first leg at Pataudry. Darren Mackey's goal that night was his 50th for the club, and it very quickly was nicknamed the £1 million goal. And this was also the first time that Aberdeen had progressed through a European tie on the away goal rule. The attendance that night was 26,275 fans, including a very healthy travelling support. A trip never to be forgotten. I was also delighted to have caught up with Derek Young from his home in Aberdeen. Hi Derek, thank you for jumping on tonight. It's great to see you as always. So let me begin by asking you to paint us a picture because I remember when we spoke a couple of years ago that you described the away team dressing room as something that you had never seen or experienced before. So can you paint a picture for us, please? Um, is, is this before the game, just in yeah, general? That, yeah, that when you arrived at training the night uh, before and all that. Um, we had... Uh, we arrived the night before, and it's an old ground. I think we knew um, that they were they were building a new stadium a good few miles away, but we were in this old rickety stadium, no roof on it. Um, pretty sure there was a running track around it as well. Uh, but just it, it just looked like it it was falling down, and they stuck a, a pitch in the middle of it. Um, but then when we get into the changing rooms. And you're expe I, I, to be fair, I don't know what you were expecting. Just it was just in your head because you were away in a European game. Everything would be nice and fine and whatnot. But we went into this big room, and it was uh, it wasn't as if it was like a changing room. It was as if it was a just a big room, and they went right. Look, we're going to need twenty chairs in here or something. And there's, there's, one, there's there was a brown leather couch in one of the corners. There was stools. It was like proper seats that you would have at a table. It was just the most bizarre thing you'd ever seen in your life. Um, they'd flung in a treatment table for the physios to use, but when you, I can remember somebody going up and then when they were lying on it, the thing was shaking, you know what I mean? So I think they'd probably set that up as well for, uh, for the boys. But it was just, yeah, you just you couldn't believe your eyes, to, to be honest. And then when we finally, we, we, we just quickly, Got myself changed and uh, out onto the pitch. But what they had actually done, um, I don't know if it was in the stadium or just behind the stadium, they were burning, I think they, was, they started burning tyres and all sorts. I mean, we were actually trying to train the night before. There's smoke everywhere, you're choking away. Um, to be fair, the pitch wasn't the greatest as well, but um you can deal with that but it was just the, the, the things they were doing they were shooting fireworks over onto the pitch at some points as well so you can just imagine it was the kind of thing you would probably read about and you kind of believe you're actually in, in the middle of one of these kind of things um all the silly tricks that the fans would, would would get up to um so that was kind of it was like and if i if i remember back i can remember jimmy was it Jimmy Calder with or Jimmy Nickel just kind of looked around and I think we'd maybe get halfway through the session and the two of them, the two Jimmies kind of just looked at each other and went, right, you know what, let's get out of here. Let's just, man, everybody's still alive. Get us, get us back in the bus <laughs> as quickly as possible. So that was that. That, that, that was kind of that. Um, back to the hotel um, and for something to eat, bit of dinner um, and then off to bed. Uh, the next morning, when we usually went to these European games, um, that was you, you would go up in the morning for your breakfast. Uh, they would maybe be, you would go a walk for maybe an hour. But it, it supposedly it all depended on where we were. You know what I mean? Dnipro is not the safest of places, to be perfectly honest. So I don't think we actually walked too far. I think you were talking maybe a wee lap with the town centre. Mm -hmm. um, where I can, I can remember a bit of security being involved as well. Um, 
same and if, if, I, if I remember right, that there was the same kind of thing happened in uh, Panathinaikos as well when we went. There was a couple of security guys kind of followed us about, um, just <laughs> just in case, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, so that was that, that. That that was the build up in the morning. Uh, when did and he then name you, the, sorry, Dave, when did he name the team? Just out of interest. I think that, that that was getting that there. That was I think we, if I seem to remember, because we would come back, you would chill, have a bit of lunch, um, and then you would go to your bed, and then when we got up a bit later on, it would be down for your pre-match, and then there was a quick meeting. Okay. But just the way kind of they had it would been set up the night before, you kind of you know who's going to be named. You could kind of half tell. Um, if I'm right, I'm pretty sure there was maybe one or two boys actually still struggling before the game as well. Mm. And whether they were going to start or not, but so that's kind of how it, it usually gets waited to the wait, yeah, they wait to the last minute. But it was you, you kind of knew we, we knew it was going to be a tough game, and I, I think the whole thing for me was the way we played against them. We, I mean, we, we definitely should have had a goal at Petodre. Right. Um, you kind of half knew they were a, a, a decent side, and you probably hadn't seen the the best of them. Um, basically, because they, they sat off a good bit at Petodre and kind of soaked it up and let us let us go and, go and try and play through them. And, and to be fair to them, they, they soaked it up and they, they, they came back with a draw. Mm. Uh, so it was we knew they were going to they were going to kind of going to get cause the manager had the video analyst stuff up. We had piles of um, stuff like that for the boys to look over uh, and, and see. So, like I said, if you took our game away, you, you kind of tell that they were a different team, uh, especially at home. Um, so that was us. We, we, we basically, like I said, we, we get to the stadium uh, and it's outside the stadium. It's chaos. It's, like I said, once again, you're back to smoke everywhere, fans everywhere, chanting all over the place, and then you come into the changing room again. And as I said, you're you walk in and you're kind of laughing again. The seats are everywhere. I think I get the edge of the one of the leather couches. <laughs> uh, and you're, you're like you're saying, you're sitting there, you're, you're getting ready, just laughing, going, I can't actually believe I'm in, I'm in this changing room. Um, but did, um, did, did the gaffer give you any specific role that night? I think there was because myself and Michael Hart um, played quite well at, at Petodre and we managed to keep their left back quite quiet um, and managed to oppose ourselves on him. Um, whether it was me coming inside and Mick getting up the right-hand side of me and, or me holding the holding wide and um, I was getting playing up my upper right-hand side. So that's all fine and good when you're when you're at home. But after we've seen all the other, like I said, all the videos and all the, the games that they played, we kind of knew um, they were going to be decent and they were going to be on the ball a lot and whatnot. So it was more a, when you get the chance, like a proper chance to, you know I mean, counter-attack, go for it, don't don't wait on anybody because the good thing when I was playing with Michael Hart, I always knew Mick could always get back in. Mick's absolutely lightning quick, you know what I mean? And I'm, I know I'll, I'll get back, I'll work back, that's not a problem. But And as it ended up happening, I just we just needed one goal. We just needed something to work, something to drop in the box, and then you've got something to hold on to. So the main thing that the manager was saying to me was more kind of pick and choose when you're going to make the runs forward because you don't want to just be busting yourself through and leaving the left back wide open to then just start charging up the park. So it was a case of, like I said, when the counter attack was properly on, then then, then go for it. But um, yeah, because we had a decent pace in the team. You know what I mean? It was. But Jamie Smith up the left hand side, and yeah. obviously I think it was him and uh, Fozzy, uh, Richard Foster, that ends up linking up for the goal. So Fozzy's got pace. I had pace up the right hand side. Mick had more pace than me, and um, so we knew we had pace to get at them, uh, and we kind of worked on that and, and uh, through the training sessions. So, uh, so, so for the goal, you've got the perfect view of Darren's diving header. But I'm kind of hoping that if Darren had fluffed his lines, that you were perfectly placed to knock it into an empty net. That's exactly what I told Daz. You're lucky you get to that. <laughs> I was coming in to fire it away. Um, but no, I was. It was one of those kind of slow motion moments in your life where you, you can see it all happening. Because as, as it's happening, I, I'm watching um, 
Fozzie managing to open up and getting the ball across. But as I said, it's coming across, and as you can see Daz just timing it perfect. And I'm thinking, like I said, when we're up around that box, I'm ex- the manager's obviously expecting the wide man to be in uh, the back post, and that's where I was. I was doing my job, and thankfully then Daz got fired out of cannon and finished it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I actually I texted him this morning, said happy one million pound goal. <laughs> Hey, Dad, so <laughs> um, he sent me a wee smiley face. Good lad. Good lad. So, uh, no, it was uh, it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Like I said, it's one of those ones. I'm thankful for a few of them through my time in football. It's everything just seems to stop, and you're kind of just looking at each other, going, "Is this actually happened? We've got the goal, my God!" So he's, as we're coming back, because like I said, we've we've. We're still in the game without actually scoring, but they're putting us under pressure. You know what I mean? Even before we get the goal, so then to break away and get the goal, you're like it's like right. Not only are we holding on to a, vict- a, a goal here, we can. Do you know what I mean? We're, everything's everything's on the line. Um, and I was laughing. I probably told you that, that, that same story as well. Just before we went out, I'm saying to Michael Hart, "It's like right, same again." up and down this right hand side, me and you work together, keep talking to me, keep talking to me, let me know where the guys are, um, we'll keep an eye on the wee left back, we know he's quick, um, but honestly, <laughs> two minutes into the game, the wee mix tucked over, so we're kind of in our defensive area, they've, they've, they're passing the ball, but passing the ball, but I've got my eye on the left back, so I'm dropping back, dropping back, I look inside to see where the rest of the boys were, and I think I was talking to somebody, telling them to move, turns around, the left back's on a motorbike, he's in the back of me, <laughs> somebody's cut the ball between me and the Mick, it's, it's through, the boy's in the byline, he's cutting it back, I'm like watching two minutes in thinking, oh no, they score, this is my fault, this is a disaster. <laughs> uh, so thank- thankfully, um, it never happened, uh, we blocked it, I don't know who gets it on the end of it, but somebody saved my life anyway, but uh-huh. it was, uh-huh. when that happened straight away, two minutes into the game, yeah. It was like, like Jesus, and I'm I'm saying I'm laughing. I'm still laughing, Mick. Now he's like saying to me, "Are you good luck? Hey, we're going to go. I'm doing that right hand side. I don't think we got over a halfway line together. Twice if you're lucky through the whole game. But the, the onslaught in the second half is yeah. probably like something I hadn't seen in quite a long time, and I did start to wonder at what point are we going to run out of steam. Yeah. Was there a point when you ever thought to yourself, we're just not going to be able to hang on here because this uh-huh. is just relentless? One hundred percent is the toughest, as in fitness-wise and running and mentally draining. But you knew how much it was. You knew exactly what we were trying to do, what where we were. Um, like I said, there was maybe some boys in the bench. Who were struggling for the game and the manager never played them anyway so they were just staying in the bench so i don't think we actually had too much mm. bodies who were proper fit mm. they came on the park anyway to, to cover so it was a case of every <laughs> just working my backside off and it was everybody's I can remember halfway through the second half i think we had managed to get a corner or something by some some miracle and uh, it was barry nick He's turned around and it was, I think I was standing with Scott Severin and he's like, I've actually only touched the ball twice <laughs> this half. And he said, this is us walking up to take a corner. And he says, and, and he says I've only touched, he says, two of them have had half me. He says, I've actually only touched the ball. <laughs> he's like, oh. And I was just chasing, like I said, I was just chasing this left back boy. He, like I said, he'd, he'd found a motorbike and he's up and down this left hand side. So it was, you were kind of all doing your own job, and then when you did get the ball, it was it was kind of you, you, you try and get two or three, four quick passes in, so you're kind of breaking away up the park. Um, but like we said, they're a good team, they're very good players. Christ, I don't know how many of them all disappeared and went elsewhere and um, played top football. So to go and do what we did against them, listen and the thing for me, and people say that, oh, I mean, he's were lucky to get through and all the rest of it, and you're going, Nonsense. better teams than us, miles better teams than us. You, you see teams in England, you see teams in the Champions League, 
doing the same thing and getting through. Mm. Um, so that's what happened and the job done. But like I said, you, you, you're just constantly looking over at the referee going, come on, come on, come on. And then you get the extra time. Um, they had made a sub. <clears throat> I think I told you that one before as well. Um, we brought a sub on, I think about 10 minutes to go. So we've got, obviously, the managers got all the information and all the players. So some new centre mid boy comes on for them and he's shouting, keep him on his left-hand side, keep him on his left-hand side. He's not got a left foot. So I think it was Seve. He's up against the boy. Um, puts him on his left foot, 25 yards out. <laughs> Hits the bar. <laughs> Hits the bar. And then and Seve just looks over. You can imagine Seve. He's shouting, screaming at Jimmy C. He's going to keep him on his left hand side. You've told me. Um, and then I think he'd done another one. Right. I think Jamie Jamie ends up making a world he save. Jamie was fantastic that night. Yeah. yeah. Um, same boy. Keep him on his left. I'm sure it was his left hand side, but he's, he's ended up tipping one uh, over the bar for the same boy. If I um, remember right. Just to finish off, I've got one last question for you. Obviously, you played many games for Aberdeen, but what I'm interested to know is how highly would you rate that performance that evening? Oh, huge. I think that everything that came with it, I, I think the, the way we won the game, the way we scored the goal, like I said, it was something that the manager had worked on and says to us. Obviously, it says to Fozzie and says to Michael Hart at the same time as well. If you get the chance when it's on, because that might be the only chances we get if it's clear for you to go and overlap. And that's what happened. Fozzie managed to go and overlap, get the ball in. Uh, like I said, Daz finished it. I was in the back post just in case, as you said, Daz slipped and missed. I would have tapped it in. Um, but just everything, the way it worked. And then as a team, I don't know, we were sitting in the changing room after it. Uh, and you're just kind of, even on the park, everybody right, were hugging and all the rest of it. But, we were actually just kind of holding on to each other. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and I, we, we have a laugh about it to this day. We get in the changing room and it was you were kind of laughing, but you were kind of numb and tired as well. So you were, like I said, so everybody's now sitting on the leather couches. Somebody's up here, somebody's down there. <laughs> but everybody, it, it's like weird because you've just done something magnificent. But nobody's really talking. Even the manager, he's just he's just like against the, the wall, kind of rubbing his head, going, "Have we actually just managed that?" Yeah. Um, and like I said, and I know I mean they, they get a goal. I think Andy ended up smashing it off the boy or the, the, the way they scored their goal. It wasn't it that great? Um, so you were panic stations again during the game. But like I said, when the final whistle went, just relief. But Magic. definitely, it's, it's, it's up there massively. Good man. Derek, thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic getting you on tonight. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And um, hopefully we will see each other again very soon. Definitely. Thanks, All mate. Lovely to see thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, fella. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Derek Young, who is now doing a phenomenal job with the club's academy. Just to finish off, I thought you'd like to see the match stats from the night. Just look at the possession for Dnipro. 78.3%, which just goes to show how much they dominated with 15 shots on target. But as we mentioned earlier, Jamie Langfield with probably his best game in an Aberdeen shirt. So there we are. We are all done. My thanks to Derek Young, to Xander Diamond, and also to Derek Ironside, who provided me with all of today's photographs. I really hope you enjoyed this tribute show. 15 years. Can you believe it? Where has the time gone? Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again very soon. Bye for now.